Rod, everybody will know who you are, but for the one or two people who might not, just, just tell us who you are and where you're based. Uh, I'm based at the University of Southampton where I'm the Professor of Government, but I have a joint appointment with Griffith University in Australia uh, and I'm there for 40% of my time. It, it's hard to talk about British political science, European political science, the study of public administration without moving into all your incredible influence and credit. I mean, how would you say the state of political science is around the world at the moment? Varied, and I hope going to become even more varied. Uh, we've lived through a period where the American approach to the study of politics, which is very quantitative based and very influenced by economics, has really been a very dominating influence. But I now think there are some significant challenges to that. For example, in Europe, uh, there is now a large group of people who are interested in what is called interpretive political science, which focuses on kind of ethnographic studies of how politicians and public officials uh, live their lives and what they do when they're actually at work. That certainly offers you a much deeper, a much richer account of political behaviour, customs, cultures, rituals. I, I'm interested in this uh, notion of moving away from a hard scientific quant space. You, I mean, what, what evidence would you give to think that that really is a shift? No, I, I, I don't want to present it like that. Uh, I think uh, evidence of any kind is valuable, whether it's quantitative or qualitative. The question is, how do you interpret that evidence? Mm -hmm. And I think people who do survey work do valuable work, but sometimes they treat correlations as explanations. I actually want to know why people did what they did and understand the reasons behind their actions. In other words, what it means to them. So I just want to push the numeric data a step further and say what does it mean to the people who are giving you these answers in these attitude surveys. So I mean, I think we complement one another rather than contradict. Although there is, I think, a deeper uh, sorry for the long word, epistemological issue that I am not convinced that some of these approaches uh, actually are reporting accurately the information they claim to be reporting. Just reflecting on your, your, your long and illustrious career, how has the nature of being a scholar changed, do you think? All right. I mean, it's not only changed in terms of what universities expect of you, it's changed dramatically in how, what I expected of me. I mean, when I first started out, I worked at a place called the Institute of Local Government Studies in Birmingham, which was a very applied place. Uh, we did uh, management training courses for senior local government officers. We did consultancy in local government. And when they wanted me to publish, they wanted me to publish in journals like the Local Government Chronicle, which were good for the profile of the Institute to its local government audience. And then later on, I went to Essex, and uh, Essex was the hard core of American-style political science in UK. I'm in an absolutely first-class department, and they thought my stuff in the local government chronicle was rubbish, and they didn't, weren't interested in it at all. And I was uh, asked to lead on a public administration degree, and I spent four years developing this degree, I think successfully, certainly successful in terms of student numbers, to discover that colleagues who had spent their time doing books and uh, articles in professional journals were promoted and I wasn't. And I had a long conversation with my then head of department and said, look, I think you have to give me the opportunity to show that I can do what the colleagues who've just been promoted can do. And I think it's at that point I actually shifted from being uh, an applied researcher come teacher into somebody who was doing a much more scholarly activity. But it was scary because I'd never actually sat down by myself to write a 300 page book ever and I really didn't know whether I could do it. Uh, it took me a couple of months just to adjust to being at home and writing all the time but once I got to it I suddenly discovered I could do it and I've never looked back. I mean you certainly have never looked back. It's a very interesting point though I often try and explain to my students the difference between, between intellectually strong but knowing how to write yes. and there are lots of people that are very bright but can't write. There are people yes. that can write but maybe not the best. Yes. I mean, what's your approach to the craft of writing? Uh, oh, I'm a great believer in the blitzkrieg approach. Get it down on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, the, if you stop at the end of the page and go back and revise sentences, you'll end up spending all of your time revising. Uh, I've got to get the beginning, the middle and the end of the story down. It's like writing a crime fiction novel. Mm -hmm. There is a sense in which I often don't know what's going to be in the conclusion. So I need to get to the conclusion and then I've got to go all the way back and rewrite the intro and then all the links between the chapters to make sure that we coherently move to the end space. Do you think there's a, a, an, an issue that the expectations on new entrants to the profession, high teaching, quality and lots of uh, hours, uh, the 
challenges of bringing in research money, writing, the admin, and now there's the public engagement impact. Yes, that's right. is, is there a limit to what an academic can do? I mean, I often get placed in the role now of mentoring younger colleagues. And, you know, they come in different species. For some of them, it is actually a job. So, I mean, they're happy to do the range of things. They only want to do the, the necessary articles for the next assessment exercise. So if they've got six to eight to choose from at the end of the period, they probably won't get any grief from the dean uh, and they've met the bill and they can go home and do whatever it else yeah. they want to do with their lives. Then there are the idiots like you and me who seem to be actually wedded yeah. to this profession yeah. uh, and it's actually part of who they are. Mm. Uh, and I think those people will always find the time mm. to do what you and I have done. Will those people always succeed though? Uh, well, again, they might not succeed institutionally as easily uh, as some of us have. But I mean, it's 20 years mm. before I got my professorship. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, they can wait 20 years, I don't mind. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, uh, I'm wearing this very dodgy suit. You, as a, a, a character, you're, you're eccentric, you're, you're, you are, you're out there in a very positive way. Uh, are you ever, particularly with the ref process, do you think there's a sort of closing down of academic yes. recruitment? Yes. I often want to go for the eccentrics, the people that are a bit different, yes. the mavericks. Yes. 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 I mean, uh, we've still got them. We have. Yes, because uh, I've just been working with uh, a young woman at Aarhus University in Denmark, and the word I used wasn't eccentric, it was flair. Flair, Just good. that capacity to think outside the box. Energy. And she's got it. And I was talking last night to a young Australian whom I'd love to recruit to my department, and I think he too has got that flair. I mean, uh, his PhD, for example, was on... Uh, political leadership in the Pacific Islands uh -huh. and he did interviews with the political leaders mm. on 11 of those islands for his PhD. Yeah. I mean, in my university he would have been told it's too broad, mm. you can't do it in the time available, it needs to be more focused, yeah. but he had the gumption to say no, 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 this is what I've done to do and I am certain that I can do it mm. and all credit to the Australian National University and his supervisor, they let him do it mm. and he got a cracking PhD yeah. and a cracking good book out of it mm. and you need those kinds of people with flair are still in the profession. Mm. Good, it's important that we make, keep that yes. space for them. Um, you were chair of the yes, PSA. Um, I'm currently chair. It's good. It's, it's a fun role. It brings challenges. Um, what, what were some of the main issues you were dealing back around the beginning yeah. of the 2000s and, and what advice might you give me? Yes, OK. Well, I'm not sure about the last point. I mean, I would like to make one general point addressed not to you, but to all of my younger colleagues, etc, etc. That I think one of the it's an individualistic profession. I mean, there's nothing more individual than sat alone in a room with the door shut on a PC writing your next book and ignoring the wife, the cat, the dog, the kids, etc, etc. It really is an isolated activity. One of the ways you can give something back to the profession, it seems to me, is to participate in the professional association. I think that's good for you. Yeah. You're doing something for somebody else, which I think is always character forming, etc, etc. It's good for the profession. We need people to get involved and it's good for our profile because we need a strong profession to actually argue the case for political science in these managerial times in which we live. Uh, and I've, well, I was told that by my PhD supervisor when we led a little coup against the then uh, bigwigs in the PSA. Uh, and so it was something I just sort of took on board without ever questioning it. So I thought, you know, part of the job of being a, an academic, even then just as a little uh, PhD student was to contribute uh, to your profession and I've just done it ever since mm -hmm. and I've always enjoyed it mm -hmm. and what I like about the PSA is you can contribute in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, yes, you can do chair, but I mean, just as rewarding for me was I set up the Public Administration Specialist Group and I set up the Interpretive Political Science Specialist Group. And the great advantage is I get all these uh, young members of the profession come to the groups uh, and I can see the next generation coming through. And it's really exciting. It was brilliant yesterday at my Interpretive Political Science Group meeting. The, the two co-conveners, Nick and I, had got an agenda, but members of the group had got an agenda and they said, this is what we went to do. Brilliant. Okay. That's exactly what I want to hear. I don't care what my agenda is. My agenda is not actually that important. Mm. But the fact that I had got younger members of the profession coming to the group at lunchtime, mm -hmm. right, not in the normal sessions, telling me, can we do a workshop on this? What about doing that? And so on and so forth. That was just absolutely excellent. Broader visibility of the profession mm. versus managerialism, mm. the ref debate yes. impact. Uh, I have been quite clear that I think with understanding the need to protect scholarship, 
having to justify through impact case studies why our research matters and should be yes. supported is a good thing. It's a good thing or if, if only there was a, a proven methodology for assessing it. Yes. And that's the problem. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we've got a proven methodology. I mean, I do case studies. I've done lots of case studies in my life. They take me a year, two years to research. I write them up. They're 8,000 words. We're supposed to pro provide case studies, which are about, what, are they two pages long? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's nonsense. You can't mm -hmm. demonstrate the kind of impact political and social science will have with that kind of a case study. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can do it better in the sciences, yeah. but the perennial problem in all of these exercises, it is dominated by the science conception of what it is to be an academic. Yeah. Um, I mean, ethics committees are dominated by science. I mean, I do not torture yeah. small animals for my research. Mm. Uh, I mean, I talk to powerful people who can throw me out of the room. I'm the one who needs protecting, not the, uh, uh, the, the permanent secretary or the minister that I'm talking to. Yeah. And ethics committees don't seem to get it. Mm. And I mean, the idea that I go in, again, typical science thing, and get a signed form from a permanent secretary that he gives me permission to interview him, it's just such a nonsense. Yeah. It's hard to know where to start. Yeah. And it's that scientific community's influence on all of this which is pernicious. Mm. The social sciences and the humanities, for that matter, are different. Mm. And they need different measures for how they have an impact. And I think, for example, if you can show that a British political scientist is having an impact in China, mm -hmm. and you measure it by lecture tours, book sales, mm -hmm. citations from Chinese scholars, that is a significant impact mm -hmm. uh, which demonstrates that public money is being well spent. Mm -hmm. Doesn't count. Not at the moment, but maybe we can make the case. Yes. Lots of um, PhD students, hopefully lots of undergraduates, are going to be watching this little uh, conversation. If you uh, were to give one piece of advice for someone thinking about an academic career, what would be your one piece of advice? Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. It's the only thing. I mean, uh, even now, I mean, I've been doing it for so many years, it's not true. When I start off on my next research project and my next field trip, I've got a little ball in my stomach because I'm all nervous about will it work, won't it work. And I come out when it's been a good interview and I've got a little skip in my step and I know that, you know, I can feel that adrenaline rush. The research is underway again. I'm curious, I'm engaged, I want to know. Uh, it's just a magic feeling. Uh, yeah. and so enjoy have fun great it's been great fun I've really enjoyed talking to you today thanks Rod it's great to see you again oh, my pleasure